Thank you all for uh, joining us. Um, we can begin uh, perhaps uh, in a moment, or would you like us to start? Or should we wait for a few more people to join us? Can we? Uh, I think you can start. We can yeah, begin. Let's start. Okay. Well, welcome everybody who is here. Um, uh, my name is Dina, and uh, I have here with me Muhammad and Rif. Uh, we also have uh, Ahmed in the background here, and um, we'd like to welcome you all to our space here in Amman, Jordan. Um, and we'd like to just start by saying a thank you to Openscape for inviting us to to be a part of uh, your network today to share a little bit about our experience and our stories with uh, Tarmis, uh, which is how we uh, experience and practice uh, planetary care where we are uh, today in our place. Um, to be honest, uh, we, uh, we like to work from a place uh, where our friend says that the world can do without theories, but it can't do without stories. So for us, our place of, uh, of trajectory, our point of, uh, motion is, is stories. We are grounded in stories. So today we wanted to take this opportunity to um, share a little bit about our story uh, here with Dermis um, and to hear a little bit more uh, from each of you about uh, your stories and again how you are experiencing uh, planetary care in your, your lives and your practices and and to see what kind of uh, things we can bridge together through and weave together through our stories. So uh, welcome again, and uh, it's really great to be here. Um, so maybe uh, we can start with with the very word that means because for us we started uh, that um, ten years ago. Ten years ago. Yeah, around ten years ago. Exactly. <laughs> um, and it started in a place of uh, movement um, and born in a place of movement. Uh, because if you recall, maybe 12 years ago uh, in our region of the world, 
uh, we were experiencing a lot of uh, movement uh, through the Arab Spring and a lot of the uprisings and, and people's movements that were happening uh, in our territories and on our like neighboring territories. Um, and that's where our story with Thermis actually began, where we were uh, at that time uh, working in NGOs, working with uh, the, let's say the typical uh, way of trying to move in the world uh, through institutions, through organizations. Um, and that's where we were uh, in 2011. Okay, <laughs> so um, as Dina mentioned, it was just like uh, 12 years ago, um, the region was moving and same day like yesterday is the 25th of January, which uh, marks the 12, 12 years of uh, the Egyptian revolution. Uh, we say it's the Egyptian revolution, but actually it moved everyone in the region, it moved us from inside. It gave us hope. It gives it gave meaning to what we do, and um, the idea that we as individuals can do something, can say no to what we don't like, and we can imagine a new or a different way of living where we all can exist and be together. Uh, with what happened in the region, uh, we have other very intimate personal story that happened at the same time, which is um, uh, Jordan. I don't know like, if I would like to say more about Jordan, where we are located. Um, Jordan is part of the Levant area, and Levant is part of the Arab countries. Um, and Jordan was divided into, um, the Levant was like a bigger piece of land. <laughs> we were divided. Um, 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 actually because of colonization and occupation, and we are left with a small piece of land that is called Jordan now. Um, and um, the natural forests in Jordan, they make more than less than 1% of the total uh, land, land. Uh, area. Uh, yeah. land area. We're mostly semi-arid uh, desert, yes. as most people would say. But <laughs> you can do a lot in the desert, by the way. So. <laughs> Uh, so at that time in 2011, Dina and I were part of a movement that happened um, um, saying no to cutting trees in the north of Jordan. They wanted to cut um, thousands of uh, indigenous uh, old trees to build um, a military academy in the north of Jordan. Uh, and at that time, we were working with an NGO that used to uh, uh, protect <laughs> our nature in Jordan. Um, the NGO did not move, and they were. They said, "This is this piece of land is not part of our nature reserves, and um, there's nothing we can do. And our role is not to say no to development every time." So um, at that time, uh, we went into the streets as individuals, and uh, we met a lovely group of people who were passionate about. Uh, the, the cause and they were passionate about like we are done with the issue of uh, um, cutting trees with uh, destruction and um, nobody to hear our voices uh, and we started um, like a campaign uh, as individuals we collected money we went to um, uh, we took people on trips to actually see, see the see. forest because we have uh, we realized that not many people here in the cities, especially, were aware that we had forests. So this was the basic uh, story that we've always been told and uh, the basic narrative that seemed to dominate our lives through textbooks and through uh, the, the public narrative is that we are a land, a, de a desert land that is a void of, of forests and greenery, a void of resources in all of their natural forms. Um, so that was the narrative that we had. So we thought the first thing was to get people to, to know, to meet the forest, to, to, to know the, the and land. And to meet the people of the forest. And to meet the people of the forest, the communities that lived around them, and um, to engage directly. And even, we said, like, even we're not going to uh, win this case, at least we can say goodbye to this piece of land in a way where we celebrate 
and in a way we learn about our land and in a way uh, in, the, in the future we can say that we did something uh, like this area was different um yeah so so that, that's where our beginnings of learning with community and what it meant to learn with the land as well um that's where it, it was seated for us and um after that, or during that campaign, um, I, I left my job with the, with the NGO uh, first, and um, I decided that this is not where real change was happening. This is, it was actually a lot of uh, work that was assuaging my, my feelings, my, uh, uh, you know, giving me leverage in society, but not actually making an, a real impact on any other level. Um, and I did something that uh, was kind of um, hypocritical of what I'd learned actually. I, I went back to university and I went to study sustainable development to try to um, to understand uh, and to uh, assuage my dis disillusionment from the institutions that I had been working in for the past 10 years. Um, and through my education, I learned uh, I learned a lot more tools and skills to to benefit from how uh, messed up the system is. <laughs> so I felt like I had become more equipped to take more advantage of this uh, failing ship and nothing really that brought me closer to healing and to healing with my community. Um, and I came back to, to Jordan um, with this sense of, uh, of wanting to continue and and actually so simultaneously to this, Elif and I uh, were very good friends even outside of work and through the campaign of Birgish. So a lot of the conversations we were having about were about how do we leave these spaces and try to to start something that that we we agree with the values of that we felt like we're more aligned with who we are as people. Um, so I came back from, from my uh, studies in university and I felt like I was loaded with all, again, all of these tools, all of this language, all of these words that alienated me completely from the people and communities around me that I belonged to, that I wanted to work with and be rooted in. And from there, we began this uh, long journey with, with words, with this trying to rediscover words and what they mean in our lives and and how we're experiencing them firsthand and not just through textbooks and not just through catchphrases and not just through uh, these kind of um, band-aid uh, soothing words. Um, so in a way, what, what we think about as care today is completely different than what I learned as care when I was studying sustainable development. Uh, I felt like it was a softer, kinder, kind of capitalism, a softer, kinder way of, of doing things that are not wise and not for the well-being of myself or my community. Um, and that's been our journey. Uh, that's been our path. And uh, basically, when we started to, to question our, our lives and to question how, how can we go about learning? And again, we, a lot of people talk about unlearning, but here we, we kind of have this um, this kind of discussion that I don't know if we can ever like unlearn anything like it's like when you delete something you always have this kind of uh, memory in, in your trash right so it doesn't ever get uh, unlearned completely but like how can we learn beyond our conditioning how can we learn beyond this um, just this reflexive way that we are um, through through modernity through capitalism that makes us these unconscious and sometimes very conscious consumers um, that's constantly moving us away from our connection to, to each other, to the earth, to everything that, that is where, even our consumption through food, like where is it coming from? Who's making it? Like where, how do we trace these things? And, and through these questions, we began to discover Termis as, uh, as we walked. Um, so that's a little bit of our story around uh, Termis. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, maybe we can give you a um, hint of what Termis actually means. Uh, Termis is an Arabic word 
And most of the Arabic words, uh, uh, if you go back, they come from a verb. And uh, termis is a, is a verb in Arabic, and it's in the present tense, which means like we're always moving. It's not in the past or in the future, we're in the moment. And um, termis, it carries more than one meaning, and this is the beauty of Arabic language. Like the same word can give you more than one meaning. Uh, the first meaning, it's related to food. It's just like when, um, when I uh, uh, dip a piece of bread uh, in a, a plate of uh, hummus or uh, other different food that we're going to share and eat together later on, uh, this action is called in Arabic, tamis. And usually we do it with group and we share the same plate or the same, um, uh, same dish. Uh, another meaning for termis is just like when you immerse deeply in something to understand it, uh, like um, uh, you completely um, connect with something uh, on different levels um, and you go deep, deep, I mean deep into the roots of the thing in order to fully understand what's happening. So termis basically, it combines both the, the food aspect and the um, and the thinking and the learning uh, aspect that is ongoing and never stops. Um, what we learned also that we're far from our sources of knowledge. And when we talk about sources of knowledge, we see um, we, we, that we're just consuming. Uh, the same as we are consuming food right now, we just buy our food from the supermarket. The same thing with knowledge. We consume knowledge uh, uh, because most of our knowledge comes from textbooks and that we learn that which we get through uh, schools and like uh, uh, institutional uh, uh, academic institutions. Um, so basically we said, okay, we went through different experiences and the knowledge we, we learned, it did not exist in books. And as Dina shared, uh, her personal experience and our journey with like um, defending the um, defending maybe it's a big word but just like <laughs> speaking up for for British. exactly um, uh, we learned that we don't know about our land um, everything that we learn is just to give us this perception that where we live is um, is a poor country uh, we lack resources uh we lack water we lack the land uh, uh basically we should be dependent uh, uh on other people to feed us or even to give us the knowledge because what we learn through textbooks is is far away from our environment um so in termis we questioned and we said okay where does our food come from and where does our knowledge come from and we said, like, we want to question what enters our bodies in terms of food and in terms of knowledge. It's all connected. Uh, uh, we can't separate them from each other. We can't separate what we eat from how we think. Um, and if we're talking about our well-being, this is like this is like an important thing of our uh, well-being. Um, Starting from there, um, maybe we went to, we started to see like, uh, maybe use our hands in a way to, to learn. And through Termis, we went back to the land. And if you want to talk about different meanings of care, um, in Termis, we had the, idea, the, the, the opportunity to, to engage in different experiences and different real life experiences. And uh, one of them was going back to the land and we started to farm. <laughs> and um, we farm, we're talking about small pieces of land where we can uh, practice our uh, maybe natural ways of farming and uh, how our ancestors used to farm, not the modern ways of farming. Um, and the plants taught us a lot and the soil taught us a lot and the insects taught us a lot that basically we need everything in order to come up with a healthy uh, or um, how we say it? Uh, balanced, uh, <coughs> harmonious 
exactly uh, 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 ecology ecology if we want to say that um we were taught like with that all the land we should plant it with the idea of monocrops but when i when we learned about the land it's just like no it needs diversity uh um, i need for example is to plant a sunflower to protect other uh, 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 short <laughs> plants to protect it from uh, direct sun exposure i need plants that grow uh, horizontally to keep the uh, soil humid and to protect the insects so isn't this care in a, in its simplest ways that um, nature can take care of it uh without us being really involved in reshaping uh how can nature um evolve and grow so yeah <laughs> um so we wanted to open a little bit of the space to see and hear from other voices and to for all of you to to hear each other as well um and to share some of your stories around uh, planetary care and what that looks like uh, in your context, in your own language, in your, in your own experience. Um, because we found like, for example, when we were thinking about planetary care, we couldn't find the equivalent in words in, in Arabic, for example, but we could find it in spirit from what we understood when speaking to the rest of the OpenScape team and, and hearing their stories about it. And as we understood that this is a theme that's been running, that you've been walking with and, and, and contemplating and reflecting on and working with, um, we wanted to hear some of those stories as well. Um, and we also wanted to, to give this space for, for each to, to say their name or to, to put where they're from, even if we don't get to speak them out loud, but like in your name boxes, maybe like where you are, um, what piece of land has uh, significance to you or what, what, where you feel connected, uh, what body of, of water, what mountain, what desert, whatever it is that you feel that you resonate with. And, um, and maybe from there, start to, to weave together some of our stories. And as we hear each other's stories, we'll start to remember and move uh, different things. So um, we would like to open the space for anybody who would like to share something. Um, and take it from there. I'm happy to share something. Please. Hi. Um, I'll move my microphone so you can hear me. Um, my name's Kim. Uh, I'm based in Glasgow in Scotland. Um, and I think my first connection with with land that because I'm from a city, so it's it's you know very much a urban uh, tenement flats that I grew up in or high rises you know it was very kind of like concrete and uh, lots of um, lots of buildings around but from a young age spending time in the countryside which is easy to get to from Glasgow it's a small city and my uncle had a croft in the north of um, of Scotland and I remember that being the first time I'd encountered a really very remote um, place where he worked for the Forestry Commission. Um, so it was uh, all sort of um, managed forest. It took me a long time to understand that the way that the country looks in Scotland isn't actually that natural. It's uh, very much kind of managed uh, land for, you know, timber or for agriculture. Um, and then the, I remember being in uh, maybe the start of my secondary education and there was a motorway being built through 
um, a section of a very a park that was very special to us when we were growing up, a park near the high flats that we lived in that was once the European Park of the Year, I think in 2008 or something, a big country park. And we spent a lot of our time there um, as children. And then again, that was when I first understood that our relationships to um to natural land are not equal the the motorway that was being built would cut off a particular community from being able to access this park um, and it was really to support the development of you know shopping centers and things like that uh, in the in the south of the city so i've been interested in this area alongside um, my other area of interest, which is that uh, I'm disabled in work inequalities and I'm very interested in the relationships between um, a relationship to land or access to land and to space and to, um, to protected, a protected environment um, and uh, inequality. So both within and, you know, as a context like Scotland and also between a context like Scotland and uh, Jordan and where those kind of inequalities lie um, and I'm also interested in how these things connect with um, decolonization, neoliberalism, uh, globalization, you know the kind of bigger forces that are at play um, and how these different issues sort of connect with each other. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what else to say, but uh, it's been wonderful listening to. Um, I really love this idea of uh, immersion. I've long uh, loved food as a way to connect with people. And I feel like when you share a meal with someone, you have a, a connection that's... Um, uh, more and uh, deeper than than it would be if you were just having a drink or going for a walk or having a meeting and um, so food has always been something that I'm really interested in and I love this idea of immersion as well and and kind of being with and in something and um, I have I'm neurodivergent so I need to be in things to learn and um, I don't learn particularly well from from reading so it's definitely from time spent and um, being in a space together and uh, sort of sharing and exchanging in that way. So thank you for, for hosting us. Thank you very much for sharing, uh, Kim. Um, I think uh, uh, listening to, to your story, uh, we definitely find the intersects whenever we, we share, we find that there's many things that intersect in our lives and in our places. Um, for us here, uh, when we when we thought Termis uh, and how we design our learning space and why we use food is exactly for the reason that, that you just mentioned is that we found that uh, one of the things that, again, that our narratives here is that, um, so we come up from a region that's full of a lot of, of conflict, again, through colonization and, and occupation um, and, the one of the narratives that we've been fed is that uh, we come from uh, they say it, which is that we come from different roots and different origins uh, so that we're all different and we have reasons. Uh, so it's like divide and conquer in uh, the basic uh, form. Um, so always focusing on the differences. Um, and one of the main concerns that we had when we were first you know, sharing with our, with our families and our friends, what it is we intended to do, because what we intended to do was to go out into streets, into the public and invite perfect strangers to come together and to share their stories around food um, and to see how these stories <clears throat> would help us create shared meaning. And one of the main concerns and, and the main questions were always like, how are you going to avoid the fighting and, and the conflict? Um, and we pretty much pictured it like our, our basic uh, Friday uh, morning breakfast where we're all together sitting around a big table. And yes, we disagree. And yes, we have these different kinds of like um, vying for space to, to, to be, to be 
present fully to, to share of ourselves and to receive the, the others that were with us. And in that space, it's a space of learning. It's where we, we learned uh, the family, and what, what, that the relationships that fed us, that were uh, love, compassion, uh, generosity of, of spirit and, and humor and uh, hospitality. Um, and in these spaces, if we could find a way to make it so that we all could speak, I, I don't know about the rest of you, but I, I have a very uh, loud spoken family, especially um, with my elders. So it was always like a struggle to, to find a space to, to share my, my truth, my world, my experience. Um, so Taramis was a way to provide that mm -hmm. for, for each of us to have a space, to be present, to be, let's say, um, the experts of knowledge of our own lives, the experts of our own world and our own truth, so that we would be able to share that and have it be received with hospitality as any other world that is shared by every other person in, in the space. Um, and through that, the idea of difference has become something that we celebrate, not something that we fear. Becomes something that, like we said, like what we learned from from the land is that diversity is is necessary. It's it's actually like without diversity, we're slowly becoming extinct, and and that's that's something that we want to revive. It's part of what we we want to celebrate and to and to again learn with joy. To again like because learning and anybody who is in uh, this uh, field of, of of learning and knows that learning is not a, it's not always a, a, an easy thing it's, it's actually one of the hardest things that we learn is that learning is hard especially when we're trying to learn something different or unlearn or learn beyond um so yes we found that these were, were mediums that really helped us and again going back to our roots um so thank you very much for that story um and again i'd like to open the space for anybody who would like to share uh um, yes, um, if I may, um, uh, uh, one thing you said uh, that interested interested me. Um, so I'm Herman Ludon. I <clears throat> I'm half German, half French. I I live in Belgium on the on the border between France and Belgium, and. Um, uh, you were saying that there is no equivalent Arabic equivalent for uh, planetary care, and that reminds me of a, a story. Um, I don't know um, if you know the French anthrop anthropologist called Philippe Descola. Uh, in the 60s, he went to uh, South America, and um, he went to the Amazon, and he wanted to to understand what kind of relation um the local um, people had to um to nature because he, it seems that uh, they had a very different relation to nature than um, he or we have in our western context and in fact the first disturbing thing he discovered is that there is no equivalent for the word nature in in among these uh, people he met in the amazonas and in fact, he had to face the fact that there were other words uh, that um, defined the kind of relation to to the the animals, to the plants, and um, but that there was that this division between nature and culture didn't exist in that context, and which brought him later on to reflect on the way. Um, the Western moder modernity was uh, built around this distinction between nature and culture, and that, in fact, it led to to the, the, the possibility for our Western civilization to put what we call nature apart and to exploit it, and to and that it was the basis for for our modernity and the current ecological disaster, and. Um, yeah, so I was just in, I just popped up this um, information that there is no no equivalent of planetary care in the Arabic context. And the other thing I was uh, I was um, 
I wanted maybe to ask you a little bit more about is this journey you made um, uh, to go and study abroad um, about uh, on sustainable development and then coming back and having the impression that what you learned uh, made uh, you a stranger among your your community or that uh, the word you had learned didn't have much sense in you. This, this is something I'm I'm just reflecting a lot on. Um, just to tell you, I uh, last year, so I'm I'm working in the cultural field. Uh, I've been working for 20 years in the cultural field, and last year I, I launched a European forum on um, on uh, on the on the necessary uh, ecological shift. Uh, we see, we, we, or I think we should uh, go to in the cultural field as well. And in in this journey, we organized a forum where we brought together a lot of people from all over Europe to reflect on how uh, the cultural field is organized and how um, unsustainable it is in a way, and how we could make it more sustainable. And now um, that I that in this collective learning process, I learned a lot. <laughs> and now I'm going back to people who weren't part of this uh, journey. And I also realized that in a way, all what I learned um, um, makes me a stranger <laughs> in this community of people of the cultural field who haven't reflected that way on ecological sustainability. So I, I, I would just, because you said you, you went through this journey through words and so just to understand also how I suppose in a way you also kept in mind some things you learned uh, from the study that, and maybe maybe you want to keep, make the world more sustainable from an ecological or from social or all these point of views uh, that are in the idea of sustainability so how how did you build this journey when you went back that was something with, that would interest me. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the, for the question and, and for the story as well. Um, the thing is that I, I studied sustainable development, yeah? <clears throat> so um, when I think about sustainability and sustainable development, uh, I, I have a lot of the, the textbook theory things that I can say, but then I think about it simply. I think about a Bedouin and Bedouin life. And I don't know if you know about Bedouin life, but uh, Bedouins live mostly, um, they're, they're nomads. They live, uh, and they cross deserts so that they, with their sheep mostly, and they find different seasons where they graze their their stock and then they move on and they sleep in tents that they make from from the wool of the sheep that they they herd and they follow the seasons and they find um, they use the land until it's basically their presence is no longer friendly towards the land and then they move on and for me when I think about this lifestyle which many would call backwards and barbaric, especially in the modern sense, what I learned from modernity, this is where I say sustainability. This is true sustainable like living. And that's where we're moving away from and not towards. So this, these are the contradictions that I that I like encountered through my education that I found that in, in my lived experience, was completely different. <laughs> there was a completely different when put in context. Um, so it made me question many other things. It made me question again. If you think about how uh, in indigenous people live, who still live with this sense of connection with the land and and their place and a connection to their history and who they are really from where we are. Um, there's a lot more wisdom in the way that we live. But a lot, um, a lot of bad uh, publicity. Let's put it that way, or a lot of uh, uh, the narrative again that exists within the modern 
world and through education and through these different institutions that uphold this uh, this modernity um, and this modern narrative. Um, these these paths are these are these are the paths of of wisdom and these are the paths of of um, again what what I would understand is the conversation around planetary care. I think these are ways of living planetary care in embodied in in action in in the way that um, that has been handed through like over through generations. So it's still like this this generational memory that exists and I. I here that this is a part of the, the, the knowledge that we're losing, that we're trying to, in a way, reroute again, and to, to find what that looks like in our lives. Because again, we're, we're not, I've never lived a Bedouin life. Um, and I don't know if I, I, could, I could do that, if I fit for it, really. But and that's not the point, going back is not the point. But the idea of how do we learn from the wisdom that still exists, that has existed. And what does that look like for us in our lives as we're facing so many challenges as, um, as a, a being within, uh, because in the end, yes, species are going extinct, forests are becoming uh, through like all of the changes that are happening, um, we're, we're at the, the heart of it and how we live and how we are today matters and and this is what Tehmis is, is teaching us it's teaching us hope um when we face a lot of hopelessness because um I don't know about how what, what you see around you but uh we see things deteriorating and not just um not just in, in nature but also in the relationships within our communities and our societies that make us stewards of the land and allow us to live in this kind of um, sense of planetary care, <laughs> this this sense of that we are one one being and the one body that we we need to to take action to to actually to be well for for each other. Um, so yeah, it may, so yeah, the education and, and this, this experience of, of studying sustainable development, um, it, like I said, I felt like I was just being taught a softer, kinder way to go about the same old dirty business. Um, and that's why I went back to trying to teach myself and to learn with my community some, a different path. Um, and I'm still learning. And that's, I think that's one of my greatest learnings is that I always want to continue learning because things will always be changing. Um, and yeah, I think we can stop there. Um, if anybody um, else. If anybody Sorry about that. Um, so if anybody else would like to share a story as well. Um, Might not be a story, but- Thank you all. Okay. Uh, if you'd like to share yeah. something. <laughs> when Dina talked about uh, the Bedwood lifestyle, um, I was lucky to, to work uh, closely with Uh, uh, with Bedouins um, in the west part of Jordan uh, in 2017. And to be honest, this was my first encounter. Uh, even though we say so Jordan is desert, but um, I never thought uh, getting like closer to and really learn from them until I went to Mexico in 2017 from Jordan to Mexico to learn about uh, uh, the indigenous people there and what's happening in terms of the struggles with, um, with the indigenous people and the Zapatistas. And then after spending two months there, I said, okay, I went all the way to Mexico, 
but I never saw what is there around me. And when I came back, I said, okay, what I want to do is to, to push myself to learn and to know more about Bedouins here in Jordan. And then in 2017, as I said, I worked closely with them. Each word counts. Uh, uh, Bedouins, or uh, as we say, al Bedou in Arabic. Okay, sorry. Can you hear me now? Hello? Yes. yes, we can hear you. We can hear you better now. Yes? Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> so as I said in Arabic, uh, um, Bedouin, it's called, in Arabic, it's al Bedou, and uh, the Arabic birth for it is uh, al Bidaya, which means it's the beginning of things. So even from scarcity, it's a beginning, how we live there, how we survive, how we manage. Yeah. And actually, when I first thought about the word and the meaning of the word in Arabic, I was, wow, I never thought about it in such a way. Because we always see the forest as a, as a source of living. We see the river, we see the ocean, we see the sea, but we never thought of the desert as a different way. And, um, and it's the beginning of things. Things start from there. And this is the actual meaning of, of the word in Arabic. And as Dina said, like Bedouins, they keep on moving from one place to another. Um, it's, it's basically, they leave the land now for it and allowing the land to nourish again and for the plants to, to grow. And they move to another area. And then in the next season, they come back to the same area, which basically, uh, uh, giving the space and the time for the area to, to allow it for, to grow again. So basically this is a different way of living that um, when, I, when I lived it firsthand, I was like, wow, it's, it's, it's like basically, I don't consume the resources. I don't consume what is there. I use what I'm allowed to use, and then I leave, and they move to another place. And there's a saying in Arabic, it's called al uh, Bedawi which is like the Bedouin is- uh, He plucks the, 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 the flowers. flowers. Basically, and this is the, like, this is my mission. It's just like, I go from one area to another uh, uh, to pluck the, uh, the flowers, and then I leave it. And then I go to the, the other area. So, so basically, uh, yeah, it's there around us. But as I said, um, and as Dina mentioned, with the mod with modernity and the modern way of living right now, um, we're not seeing this as a way of living or learning from. And uh, as we said, like with each engagement, we make a different meaning of care that we do not see. It's more of an action rather than a word that we keep on saying. And uh, but I think we need the eyes to see and uh, the heart to open heart to 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 receive to receive and the mind to reflect. So the question is still out there for you as well. Anybody who would like to share a story around this? Um, and maybe it'll be our last one before we uh, take a, a a break to get our foods in order and uh, and start to 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 dip as we dip. <laughs> I would love to share. Sorry. <laughs> I'm a part of uh, this piece of the family since 10 years when all family started. I was very young, I was 14 years old when I started. 
Um, actually, that means I would love like to talk about it as what it did for me and uh, what what I learned from techniques actually. Um, I learned like more about how to be connected to the land, how to be uh, acceptance, how to accept uh, yourself, how to accept people, how to accept deference around us. Uh, and like, I remember like, was like my favorite time per week. I like, think we are going to uh, Tamiz uh, to share our stories and to talk about what we did this week and how we were like running around to prepare the event that we were doing. Like it was a super, um, a very, very beautiful part of my childhood when I was young. And um, one of my favorite uh, Tarmise, let's say, uh, when we talk about uh, memories, if you remember it, it was like one of the most uh, close, to the heart. close to the heart. It was one, more, one of the most close to the heart to, to me, actually, because like it lit up. I I'm still have friends from this session till now after 10 years because like it let us uh, open to each other to talk more about our memories about something that affect us in the past and how we passed through it and it helps me actually to pass through a lot of things uh, when I was young um, so that's it and like one more one more thing um, how I started playing music actually was like I was always passionate to music, but like really what what's the place that was supporting me somehow about music and like, yeah, try this, listen to this, let's sing together, let's play something together. It's the least. It was like a place I could share uh, a lot of things. So it's really a family and like, it's a very, very important concept. It should, it should uh, sh to share and all over the world. Uh, because like, let's say food and good people always be nice and like amazing. So that's it. Combination. A, a very amazing combo, combo let's say. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Have fun. Um, okay. Um, so perhaps let's uh, take uh, this 10 minutes to stretch our legs, move around. Um, and uh, ask the question again. And, yeah. um, yeah, we can we can pose uh, again a question for for you to 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 think about a story while you prepare your food. Anything you want to uh, to bring back to the to the table, um, but ar around how you see uh, and experience planetary care in your lives, um, and what does that look like? Um, it would be really great to hear your stories. Uh, so let's. Uh, Come back together at 610. Um, we're here preparing our, our table. So we'll hope you'll be preparing your table as well. Um, and let's try to uh <laughs> uh, we'll see you in 10 minutes. Oh, 
Madrila ma khandak ya ba madril you've set yourself up with uh, a nice uh, light meal <laughs> just to, to share. Awesome. So we've got our hummus here, our falafel, yes. our olives, <laughs> and of course, our bread. Our bread. And we have the like juice, the stuffed eggplant. <laughs> um, <coughs> so now we're going to start yes. and while we dip uh, we can still continue with our stories and and share uh, again if, if whoever would like to share what they have uh, going on as a meal today um, that would be lovely um, but also maybe before we get started it's it's worth noting that um, today uh, actually in India uh, right now uh, there is um, a call for a uh, climate fast um, and we realized the irony that we invited you all to come and share a meal together on this day and we weren't aware of it until last minute unfortunately but it's really worth noting that um, uh, when I'm uh, uh, I don't know if anybody has heard of them um, but uh, a person who has been working a lot in the Ladakh community um, and to raise awareness around uh, global warming and, and what's happening in the mountains and the forests and the rivers uh, and the Himalayan mountains, um, especially now that they're, uh, they're going to start allowing for mining and ex resource exploitation in these uh, um, still natural areas uh, that are untouched. Um, and um, he will be doing a five-day fast at 18,000 feet. Um, and he has invited uh, people all over India to, to, to do one fast today uh, so that, that there would be more pressure on the government to be more uh, aware of, of what's happening to the mountains and these natural areas in the Himalayas. Um, so perhaps since we are not fasting today, we can eat with the intention to nourish uh, all of these people who are fasting for, for our natural places um, with the hope that they'll feel this energy and feel the sustenance that, that comes through us as a collective body. Um, so thank you uh, for your support. <laughs> Um, um, 
So perhaps we can, again, open the space uh, to, to share stories around uh, what planetary care looks like for you and your places and your languages and your contexts. Um, we shared, we've shared a little bit about what, what we feel it looks like for us here. Um, and as we continue to, to connect with you all, uh, it would be really lovely to hear your stories. Uh, so if anybody would like to share, please go ahead. Uh, I would just start with a, a small uh, connection also to um, something that uh, Hermann was mentioning, but uh, uh, yesterday I, um, I uh, went to the cinema and I saw a film uh, called uh, The Eight Mountains, and it's basically the story of uh, somebody who comes as a child uh, from Turin, also from a city, uh, as an 11-year-old child to a small village. Um, in uh, the it, it, Italian mountains, and um, and uh, he's meeting there uh, accidentally, like the only um, child that's still living in uh, in this place, because uh, from a little village of two hundred fifty or even more people, there was uh, now it it shrank to twelve, and there was one child and these two childs become friends and also they keep the friendship and um and the the one from the city is um uh when he was turned 30 or something he came comes with friends and they having this romantic uh feeling uh on the table sharing food like we do and they were talking about the beautiful landscape and then uh, the person uh, living in the in in the mountains, uh, he said, like, uh, we don't speak about the landscape, we just speak about the things we can touch, <laughs> like we can uh, we speak about the tree and the 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 green herbs and whatever, but the the this abstract thing we don't we we don't have a word or we don't use we we don't use the passion to speak about it. We probably because, because we are already there. Um, the whole film, I will not uh, develop further, but the whole film um, resonated with me because I was, um, I'm uh, coming from a small city in Germany and uh, now I'm based in Berlin. But uh, when I was uh, 18, 19 after school, I was uh, living, um, no, I was working for three summers on a, a Swiss farm in the mountains. Um, because I like to work with my body and outside, and um, and uh, they were uh, haymakers, uh, and so I enjoyed uh, cutting the grass. And uh, for me, this was really something. Uh, also, I was uh, romanticizing uh, deeply, probably, but uh, that was like they were living in in a house that uh, was built by the. Uh, uh, trees cut from the region like not no not like here like we we produce we buy materials and they come from whatever and then we build a house but it's really built with the people from there with the material from there and um and but now with this uh, so i enjoyed it three summers um uh, they stopped uh, having this uh, hay and, and, and cows. But uh, at, at that time, I was not thinking about um, what precisely we were doing, because of course, the Swiss little farms, they get a lot of subvention money to um, take care of the mountain uh, landscape. So to cut the grass, if it's, uh, if it's very remote, then you just cut it once in a year. And, uh, if it's, uh, and you can cut it up to three times uh, per year. And you cut it and you keep it in your uh, Heuschober, whatever, in your place. And uh, because uh, this is a nourisher um, for the cows. And they had three cows. And it was such, a, such a, an amount of work that was actually just for feeding the cows for at least, let's say, like six or seven months. And... Um, and I was now, like when we were talking about what we eat and what is uh, uh, like uh, 
is it sustainable to to eat meat or to feed cows and whatever it's uh, something that just reoccurs now i mean 20 years or 25 years later that uh, that uh, this is kind of also i mean it's very for me it, it is very uh, down to earth it's very like small circles uh, regional uh, it makes completely sense but on the other hand it's a lot of work for <laughs> to to produce uh, the cheese and the milk and the butter and uh, maybe some some uh, some meat uh, of uh, out of three cows that also die from time to time and then you have to buy uh, new cows and whatever it's just it's it's uh, it's more connected to the also the change of perception uh, and the development of uh, like what used to be a practice maybe or might might have been a practice of planetary care um, is now uh, yeah maybe we we there's a different perspective on that and we uh, yeah we need to just wanted to to share this yeah. Just one more thing, just last, uh, lastly, I, I like, I, I wanted to express uh, how much I enjoy the format of sharing stories without teaching others, because when I was a kid, people used to tell me stories to, to con convey a message, so you don't have to, or you know there's this Jesus or whatever you know <laughs> like uh, I, I just uh, wanted to thank you for this uh, for this format um, bringing up the format of Tachnis really resonates a lot uh, thank you for that uh, Wolfram um, uh, actually I think uh, the idea of, of stories has been something that we're um, we're starting to find uh, a lot more appreciation with. The more that we we sink into them, that the more appreciation we have is because a lot of our learning has become about um, really connecting with people in different contexts. Like the story that that we've shared about our time in Mexico, and um, and we find that when when we have uh, a lived story that we we share, whether it's uh, somebody else's that we receive or or one that we we, we live and experience, um, are and reflecting on these on these experiences and these stories, that what we're we're finding that we're becoming a lot more rich in in our appreciations for the relationships that we have, um, and not just with each other, with ourselves and with with the world. Um, and I find one of the the, the relationships that we, we've we've always found a cradle in has been um, has been with the art world because um, I've been I was sitting here thinking to myself like uh, what what brings like what would bring and what would be the connection between OpenScape and and how like we would resonate with each other um, and what we do and in our practice and uh, and we I was just thinking about how living is, is is art it's an art of, of i guess that is a thing the art of living but um i'm not quoting any book uh, but the idea of how how do how do we um going go back to finding the beauty and in, in everything that we experience in our everyday lives um and again try to share that um and I and I find stories is a is a beautiful medium. And I think because we're probably part of a very oral culture here, um, so for us, uh, yeah, for uh, us. Uh, stories are a big part of how we um, how we learn, like you said, uh, our our histories, our traditions, our um, our different um, ways of being. So uh, I was curious to hear more a little bit about what you, the mediums are in the different parts of the world where you are all in. Um, because uh, like I said, I think as uh, in the Arab world, uh, like storytelling is a big part of our, uh, it's in our blood, so uh, in our culture. 
Um, a Thousand and One Nights is a perfect uh, example of, of that. Like uh, Shahrazad survived A Thousand and One Nights just telling stories every night so uh, that she wouldn't, she wouldn't be uh, killed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah. So she had, she had to tell stories to, to live. And we find that that's part of what, what we're, we're doing here right now is that um, we tell stories to live. So um, as this is our medium, um, I don't know if you share the same medium or if perhaps uh, there's uh, other mediums that you have in your context that you would be able to share with us. Um, that would be really lovely to hear. Um, I'm, I'm gonna speak really quickly because I'll need to go uh, in a second. I'm so sorry, a meeting came in after I got, after I'd, um, Kim, we don't hear you very well, I'm sorry. Because I still don't have this <laughs> microphone thing going on. Um, Glasgow has a really unique, uniquely strong history of collectivism and community networks. Um, so much so that other cities in the UK that have a similar socioeconomic um, background or post-industrial um, or, or post-industrial cities um, with the similar types of community, they don't have the same resilient community networks. So when you were talking about practices of planetary care, the things that immediately come to mind are, you know, we have this Facebook group called Brilliant Bartering where people exchange, you know, someone came to pick up two benches that we don't need anymore and took them and brought us some plants in exchange for it. So it's about, you know, keeping these um, social connections, but also uh, trying to reduce the amount of, you know, things that we buy. Um, since moving into the building that I live in, I've set up a WhatsApp group and we are putting together a, 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 um, a directory of the kinds of tools and skills that we have in the building so that, you know, not everyone needs to buy a tall ladder because we have one. Not everyone needs to buy a hedge trimmer because we know the woman downstairs has one, that sort of thing. So, and this is actually something that it's not my idea. I came across it when I was uh, doing some research in Australia some years ago and a woman who does a sustainability festival in a small part of uh, Perth and Fremantle has been doing this sustainability festival for years and it's because she has a st her street have all signed up to this way of um, living and way of, of uh, you know being in community with one another so I think the strength in Glasgow is that sense of community that really uh, long-standing reliance that we have on each other we go to each other for support we have huge mutual aid networks you know there's a real um, spirit of that kind of collaboration and activism but I wanted to also mention one thing which was related to what I was talking about earlier around the relationship between sustainability and planetary care and care um, when we're dealing with uh, our personal challenges. So for me, it's disability. Um, and one of the things that I've had to really connect with much more than some of my peers from a younger age is mindfulness and um, embodied practices you know, really connecting with my myself and what's happened is it's given me much strong, a stronger sense of empathy. I can name and understand the physical experiences that people are, that I have and that people describe to me. I can, I can um, put myself physically into how someone else might be feeling about something because I've cultivated this. And it's also about cultivating your sensitivity, your awareness, um, you know, doing a sound bath once a week cultivates my attention. It helps me become more aware of my environment. So I think there's something about those kind of personal embodied practices as well as how we're in relationship with each other that feels very strong in Glasgow. These are both things that seem very um, alive here. I will leave it there. <laughs> um, thank you very much for that. Uh, and we're still leaving this space open for anybody who would like to tell us about uh, what 
what practices, what mediums um, of care exist in your contexts, in your languages, in, in your experiences. We're okay with silence. We're okay with silence. <laughs> Usually um, we're in the same space together. So silence actually feels perfectly comfortable. Um, again, usually we don't do termis on a virtual medium. So uh, we're not really sure how silence works uh, virtually. So we're, we're trying to feel our way into it. Um, but if you feel like there are no stories that come to mind or that anything you'd like to share and, or you have questions or anything, um, also please feel free to, to take us where you are uh, so that we can connect because um, that's how we learn. I mean, connecting to the medium so, question, um, there is one thing that uh, I'm currently busy with is um, to like, what do you do when you're living in a big city and you don't have a garden? Uh, because uh, not many people that I know in Berlin uh, uh, have ac access to a garden or if there is a garden, it's uh, outside a bit and it's mostly a shared one. And they are also the very privileged people. So, uh, but we have a, a court um, a very shadowy court uh, where I work. And uh, what we are trying to do now is to transform the court, um, the back backyard actually, um, to uh, kind of a garden. It starts pretty now, uh, pretty much now, like in February, we are beginning to plant. And in March, we are continuing to plant. And then hopefully in June, uh, we will already see um, some of the yeah of 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 the green and the herbs and uh, the flowers. Um, so this is something though that we do uh, because nature or the big uh, the bigger picture is uh, hard uh, hardly accessible. So we do we look at what we have and um, and then we try to do something with that. And it's an experiment, so it can also. Uh, be the case that in summer we say oh it's it was a lot of work and it didn't work out well but um so we are pretty confident that and at least we take a try uh, that's uh, amazing for you to share with us uh, thank you um yeah, I think uh, we can actually speak to, to similar experiences here um, in terms of how we're trying to 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 seed hope, um, and we find like like Vipo was saying, a lot of hope and and growing and and seeding and cultivating the earth, um, and a part of uh, how we we've been trying to go about that uh, has been through a lot of community farming. Um, and some that's been uh, inspired in, in Palestine through um, Sleiman and yeah. that's Reef's experience with that and something and, uh, can share about. And the ladies and uh, I'm and, not, and I some, think this is an interesting. Um, another uh, one of the experiences that we've uh, tried to share in community um, happened to be when a friend of mine was uh, coming to visit from Argentina and actually, um, she does some pretty interesting uh, uh, work in, in learning and uh, she created her own uh, journey uh, for learning uh, through um, different experiences and more of a, a journey of going from place to place uh, like through South America uh, and she came to Jordan, uh, Palestine, uh, Uganda. She planned this learning journey for herself um, and she started to learn about uh, like different farming, mud building, uh, 
different uh, dance movement therapy, different things that she found interesting and that she wanted to, to come together and put her own school when she went to uh, back to Argentina. Um, and when she was here, uh, we happened to be visiting a, a, a mosque because this was something that, that she wanted to, to get an experience of, of a mosque. Um, and we happened to visit this mosque that was uh, in um, the eastern part of the city. Um, and uh, in that mosque, there was a community of women who would, would gather in the mosque. And we, uh, we happened to be taking a, a tour with uh, one of the people who plans activities for the women in the mosque. And we saw a piece of land that was there. Um, and uh, when we saw the land and we saw a group of women who were part of this community and we saw that there was no activity, it wasn't being like, it wasn't being cultivated, it was barren. Uh, it was a part of a city where, where like nutrition uh, from like, from things that we grow is, is like uh, agriculture is not, not uh, abundant there. Um, yet, not very long ago, most of this city area was agricultural land. So uh, the shift has been very rapid. Um, so we even the name of the area is called uh, Jabal Zuhur in Arabic, it means like the hell of roses. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, and, and most of our areas actually have the names of, of different plants and different uh, things that used to be grown in these different areas um and now all we have are uh, we have just an urban setting um so uh one of the 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 social kitchens that we we tried to design in, in like uh, collaboration with this group of women in the mosque was to try to put together you know our aspirations were for a, a, a food for a natural food forest um to, to plant it to 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 basically uh, edible. Um, an edible forest yeah. to rejuvenate the, the land, to, to plant it, to have things grow, and over the long run, um, come together and have an edible forest. Yeah. Um, um, actually, um, we started to go there on a weekly basis. Um, and we were a group of maybe eight to nine women. Um, we had basic tools. <laughs> and at that time, we had like little knowledge about farming. And we started to learn from each other. So women, they had like more experience. Uh, and as we say in Arabic, like idhum khadra, which means like- uh, Their hand is green. <laughs> yes, whatever they plan, it goes. <laughs> um, uh, and we, it was like, um, it's, it lasted for around a year and a half to two years. Um, uh, but uh, we, we were not able to create the edible forest also due to reasons that had to do with like uh, governmental issues and like uh, we're not allowed to use the land anymore. Um, but I can say that uh, what we weave together in terms of uh, relationships uh, in terms of uh, uh, the knowledge that was uh, uh, learned and exchanged, um, I think without the land, we wouldn't have we wouldn't have gotten the chance to meet with these ladies because on our daily basis we wouldn't get like, the chance to be friends with them. But what brought us together is the land, is our passion to to farm and to learn. Um, uh, and it's interesting how land brings us back to our core, uh, maybe our true selves. Uh, yeah, because in the modern way of how we live, uh, our paths wouldn't cross at all. <laughs> yeah, uh, and this is like, yeah, this is our first experiences with uh, with farming and going back to the land and using our fingers and, and hands and dip them in the soil. <laughs> I think it's also worth noting to speak about context is that, <clears throat> so we said Bedouins are a part of uh, our, our, our roots. Um, 
but we're also farmers. So you have like our society is made up of, of Bedouins or far farmers or, or city dwellers, but they're the minority. Um, and we're not talking about uh, generations like that are old generations. No, like we're talking about like our parents' generations, um, our grands grandparents' generations. So, um, and this knowledge that of working the land and, and being rooted is something that we've 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 been losing amongst ourselves and in this age group um and and that's where we find that like this idea is that we we see extinction happening before our eyes and how do we how do we again try to see what we have around us and to work with this this concept of of abundance because in the end we are desert people and abundance is how we survive because if we saw things in terms of scarcity we wouldn't be here um, we wouldn't be able to survive in a place like this so I think um, and I feel like a lot of of what uh, working with the land and, and and actually like being present where we are and, and grounded and rooted in in our place it's uh it's giving us the means to again look to the smallest plot the smallest uh, like uh opportunity to to grow again so i i feel like uh, the story that you shared will come is very important in the sense of this concept of how do we look at abundance um and, and see things in sense of what is what is available. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, thank you for for bringing that into the space. Uh, so yeah. we're kind of uh, reaching towards where we have space for maybe another story or two brief ones if we uh and, and give some space to, to hear some listen to some music so um i'd like to open the space to anybody who'd like to share a story um or, or have a question um and to uh to share that before we wind up so uh, give the space to you give the space to you um <clears throat> Yeah, maybe it's not it's not a, a story. It's more uh, again a, a question. <laughs> um, thank you very much for all this uh, for this setting for for it. Uh, uh, it gives the opportunity to think a lot. I think um, the question I have, or, or maybe I start with a small story. I, I I now live in the countryside. I I have a small garden, so I I. I'm going to grow my own vegetables and I installed a dry toilet to save water and so on and to use uh, to use it as a, in the compost for, for the vegetables and so on. But um, um, the thing is, uh, when we think about the ecological redirection we should go to, um, what we will do as individuals will not be enough if we just think it on an individual basis. And um, um, I've been working for one year and a half on questions on how we could uh, rethink the economical model of uh, the artistic field in Europe. Um, and um, it quickly comes to the question of, uh, of um, competition versus coordination versus cooperation. And um, so I was just wondering how you articulate this very uh, individual, uh, if, I, I mean, I understand that you're in a way building a community through this story, um, but also how you, um, you told at the very beginning that uh, also your, practice was rooted in the, the Arab Spring and so on. So how do you re, uh, how do you link uh, this um, what you do on a small scale with the bigger picture of 
maybe systemic change, if this makes sense. Um, yeah. Um, thank you for the question. Um, so uh, I'm going to answer the way I would answer in this um, another way. <laughs> um, so I think a part of what I've been learning uh, is that the way I see the world is not, it's not fixed. Uh, and it's not exactly as I've been taught to see it. And I feel like um, I feel like what I've learned is not even something I have words to share, words to express. Like I, I don't know how to express this aspect of my learning. So I'm gonna call it more of a, a belief or a faith that I've developed through this practice. And and I, that is this kind of faith in, in contagion. Um, so it my learning is happening on a, let's say the, the, inter, the inner scale learning, um, something inside of me is moving. And, and when I'm sitting in a group with other people, there are things inside of them moving and in a way we're infecting each other with whatever that motion is or whatever that, um, whatever that, uh, Maybe, maybe it's the spell, the spell of a story that we can share with each other. So in a way, um, it's not just my words. It's, it's, it's not just uh, his words. It's not just her words. It's, it's how we are as we share them, how we, we, um, we act in, in the sharing um, and in the spaces in between, because it's not it's not about anything that's prescribed. Like it's not about here's the design and you just take it and you replicate it and you do it. There's something about genu genuinely wanting to learn to be better and being in a space with other people who genuinely, genuinely want to learn to, to be better. And when I say that is it's in a sense that when you recognize how much of what you really truly believe and how you are programmed and automatically acting in the world are in in contradiction. This this kind of um, sense of uh, unease with the of anxiety of depression of of worry of which is part of and parcel of of modernity and how we live um, in this uh, uber fast. Uh, uh, world where we never get to process, we never get to reflect, we never get to to like to really even conceive of what where we are in life before it, it ends abruptly, um, or maybe not so abruptly, but in in the sense of how do we slow down? Like how do we really like slow down and take a moment um, to re-engage with where we are, who we are, who we're with how we're being, what that looks like, what, what is it going to look like uh, for future generations, for our children, for their children. I, I think these are just very basic things. They're so simple, but sometimes the simple, simplest things are the most difficult, really. Like uh, sometimes we, we can theorize them quite well, but then when it comes to, to doing them, um, it, the, the idea of between, the gap between practice and, 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 and theories is, usually very huge. Um, so again, it's a place of faith. Um, and and I really I really used to, to be a, a, a functioning cog within the machine and, and the institution because I, I truly believed, I really believed when I was in uh, the NGO world that I was making the world a better place one word at a time. Like that was really how I felt about what I was doing. Um, and the Arab Spring, the Arab Spring was a, a movement. It was that disruption. It was that earthquake. It was uh, a pandemic. It was, the, it was the boom that makes you think, okay, wait, what's happening? And you wake up and, and it's a moment. And, and I feel like maybe a big, the biggest 
challenge of modernity and its greatest skill is that it's like this pendulum of like putting us wee back to sleep, to sleep, <laughs> and and that's what, and we just slip right into it because it's because there's no time to really think about it. There's no time to, and it's always this this rush and this run and and the answers there there are no answers. And the people we look up to are usually just as lost and confused as we are. And we're, we're all learning, really. And I think it's, um, it at least is a way of, of trying to stay woke. It's a way of trying to, to stay connected, to, to really remind ourselves constantly, because we're always forgetting. And, and that's why it's a way of life. And we call it, it's a medium for learning. Yes, it's a medium of, of learning uh, together. But it's also a medium for for being in 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 this world that we feel is is lacking wisdom. It's full of information, full of information, but really very little wisdom. And that's what we're trying to to harvest. That's what we're trying to seed. And and because we we wanna we wanna live. We wanna live with joy. We wanna we want to to celebrate. We want to celebrate life. We want to celebrate ourselves. And our differences, as well as our similarities. Um, and to be honest, like again, talking about context, I mean, uh, I'm an Arab Muslim woman in a world that uh, pretty much labels Arabs and Muslims as terrorists and uh, things to be feared, or barbaric, or backwards, or or not even non-existent, or non-existent, because I'd say like I'm. Uh, part Palestinian and uh, I have other Palestinians uh, friends here in the room and, and otherwise who would some people don't even believe that they exist anymore or they exist in their lands anymore so the entire story of who we are and where we are in the world is is slowly being retold or overrun or taken to a different place so there's a lot of healing that needs to be done um, and that's what we're trying to do. So it's it's a matter of healing, and healing not only on a personal, in a personal place, but healing together. So um, I, I don't really know if that answers your question because I feel like there's no real answer. But uh, this is what we're trying, and this is our path, and it's and that's why we, it's about learning. And again, I hope that's anything. That's something that we keep doing, is to keep learning how to be better. Uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Um, I don't know if we have time for a last question or if you guys would like to, again, this is an open space. We usually give people the chance to, to share how they feel about what, where we are and what we're doing. So we're gonna put that out there. And if anybody has anything, um, we'll give you space to share that. Um, otherwise we can wrap it up. Okay, uh, so I guess uh, we can go into um, the music and um, we just want to say thank you very much for, for your time, for your stories, for, your, for listening, for, for being, um, and for this wonderful opportunity to, to share with you all. Um, I we hope you enjoyed your experience. And uh, if you ever find yourselves in Jordan or anywhere where we happen to be, it would be lovely to share that piece with you firsthand and uh, live and to actually uh, be able to, to, to have that connection. And maybe also this is an invitation for everyone like that we start creating our own meanings of things. Uh, now we talked in this session, we talked about care and planetary care and how to make meaning out of our personal stories. But also maybe it's interesting to think about other words that shape the way we live. And um, because we do have the right to make meaning. 
and this is, I think, the, the link between things of the movements that happened around us. Like, we have the rights, <laughs> and we can. <laughs> and we have the responsibility, maybe yes. even more. We do have the responsibility. Yes. So. Thank you. Thank you. Shukran. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very inspiring. Thanks a lot.